Hello, my name is uh, Martin van Roonen. I'm an Asphix, and you're watching Metal Blast TV. Uh, just to start things off a bit slow, um, for those of for those people who are unfamiliar with Sphix, could you maybe tell us in your own words what people are to expect from your guys' music? Well, basically, it's just really, really brutal, uh, very old school kind of death metal. You know, like it was uh, when it all just started. You know, back in uh, well, let's say like end of the 80s, more or less. And uh, well, it's very loud. It's it's got no blast beats. It's got many. Many slow parts also in it, and uh, well, when we play live, it's very intense. I mean, there's not this, you know, there's a lot of action going on on stage. There's very loud volume, and uh, well, that's basically what Essex all about, really. Not, uh, you know, not compromising, no bullshit, no nothing. Just, you know, what you see is what you get. All right, yeah, that's definitely what I like to hear from my <laughs> experience with this fix over the years. Um, I've been a big fan for a long time, and that's exactly what I've always heard. Just. Just straight to the point, old school death and doom metal. Yeah. That's what we like to hear. Um, I, uh, I personally know the reasoning behind uh, why the band has chosen to name the album Death Hammer. But uh, for those that don't, would you might be, would you be able to explain why that is the album name? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I, you know, I'm, if I if I look for album names, I always want to, you know, have something that really, you know, is really gripping and really, uh, you know. Well, drawing some attention, you know, not some stupid kind of name that no one can remember. And I reckon, like, at the time, like, Death Hammer is something that, boom, you know, it just really, you know, yeah, hits hard like a hammer, exactly. And, um, yeah, when I came with the name, the, the, the boys were like, fuck, you know, this is really good. And, uh, yeah, we like it a lot. But it's a bit of, um, um, yeah, it's more or less like I, I took it from, like, there's, there's, there's a book written by the Inquisition called The Witch Hammer, uh, which was more or less a guidance on how to... Uh, yeah, find, detect, uh, interrogate witches and, and, and heresy, heretics and all that. And, uh, well, Death Hammer is a bit, well, it's fictional, you know, it's a non-existing word, of course, but it's supposed to be a book in which uh, the rules of uh, how to play and perform and write death metal uh, the proper way uh, is, um, is explained. And, uh, well, maybe the album, you know, shows that for itself as well. So that's a little bit of story behind it. Because yeah. there's too many bands right now that I think, and not just me, but the band, and as many people also like on the world in the world, like uh, you know, like that, that you know, that have like a good heart for for like the kind of death metal that we play, and uh, they think the same. You know, there's too many bands that apparently don't really know what's all about. Yeah, you can absolutely put me in that exact same camp as the rest of you guys. Let me talk about your last album, Death the Brutal Way, really quick. This was your first album back once uh, once the sticks got back together over about, what was it, an eight, uh, seven, eight year hiatus. And yeah. um, it was met with an overwhelming amount of positive feedback. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a very heavy and visceral comeback album. Mm -hmm. Did you guys happen to use the fans' reaction to that last album to sort of push a different way to create something even more earth shattering on Death Hammer? Well, no, not really. But, you know, with us, what the case is with us is that if we like the songs that we write ourselves, then we know our fans like it because, you know, we are we are fans of the genre in the first place. You know, I could say like when when I hear this album and it's a different vocalist because I don't like listen to myself, you know, I'm not like a sort of megalomaniac or something. But if there would be a different vocalist with the same kind of stiff you know, with a kind of style, then I would love the album myself as well. So that's the whole point, you know, behind what we are doing. The thing only with Death the Brutal Way at the time was that um, well, we had, of course, like with with Eric not in the band, uh, we knew that our fans would be skeptic against, like you know, especially Paul. Oh, you know, is he able to replace Eric the way that we expect him to replace him? And you know, well, we wouldn't have been Asterix if we didn't know that, you know, before. But um, after the, the the reaction of the fans, <clears throat> you know, after the release of uh, of Death the Brutal Way, then we knew that we did something good to them, and they liked us as well. I mean. When we play the songs live, like like Death of Brutaway or Scorbutix or you know, just name a few, uh, Mercer or something, um, they like it. They go they go as, as nuts as they do on one song as the Rack of Vermin or uh, the Bismarck. So we knew we did a good thing, and we knew that we, that we didn't disappoint our fans, which is of course like to any band, very very important, the most important thing. And from there on, um, yeah, we're just trying to perfectionize the kind of style that we have. And that's what's, you know, what's, what the difference is between Death Hammer and 
Jeff had ruled away, is that we're more perfectionized. The line is, you know, becoming better now with Alvin in it. He's way more, um, yeah, he fits way more well in with that. I mean, he's very enthusiastic. He's very proud to be in the band. He's been a metal metalhead for like years, and he really knows how to, you know, how to play his bass and, and give it the extra boost that we like and that we need too. So, um, yeah, it's it's never been better, you know, for us as, as you know, as the lineup right now is really. And I think uh, you can hear that in, on the album too. That it, I mean, it was not just only done with you know with his hunger for brutality and the way that we are, uh, but also that it was you know it was played in with a lot of fun too. You know, we were just enjoying ourselves. We just had a good time doing so. And you know, many bands just considering recording an album as a big stress problem and all that. But for us, it was okay. You know, just let's let's do this one or you know this blah 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 blah. You know, just just you know just relax and really lay back. Uh, from the musicians that I've talked to over the years, they said it's like probably once they started to treat recording an album or even playing music as more of a job than it was something doing that they loved, then mm -hmm. they kind of felt that the musical process was beginning to suffer a little bit. Do you think the, that that's a very uh, apt thing to say? Yeah, but, you know, the difference is that, that you can, you know, like nowadays, you don't need to, to go in a studio for a couple of weeks and start working. You know, I mean, that's what we, <clears throat> that's what Paul and me, for example, I like, discovered when we, you know, we're working with Eddie from Ayla Bullets. I mean, it's possible to set up a small kind of house studio and you just, you know, you, you record your guitars there. And of course, the guitars are more or less like always the, the yeah, the most important thing when you, when, you know, when you talk about death metal. And, and for Asterix, for example, like the drums are not such a big thing because, you know, Bob is doing pretty basic stuff. And, and well, right now it's like a little clockwork. I mean, he just does that stuff like really quickly and he goes, okay, nice one, I did this one and I'm happy and satisfied with it. There's not much, you know, to do with all kinds of technical crap. We took our time, you know, if, if I said like, okay, if I've got the lyrics ready and I know the vocal lines what I'm going to do, then I'll just go to Harry in the studio and just, you know, sing him in, you know, whenever I can or whenever he's got time. So it was just really relaxing. We didn't have any blocks or, 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 or inspirational problems or something, not at all. That's very good to hear because I've had, I, Century Media was gracious enough to give me a, an advanced copy of Death Hammer, and it's really, really good. Sorry, to, sorry to kind of kiss ass a little bit, but uh, <laughs> but it is. I, I I very much enjoyed it. Um, I found it very similar to Death the Brutal Way, but honestly, that's what I liked was was just hearing that raw old school sound and that raw old school emotion. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks um, a lot. Thanks yeah. for that compliment. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Um, no problem. And actually, speaking of uh, speaking of fans and again your music, uh, last month is Fix uh, released an EP entitled "Rain of the Brute." It features yeah. that that track and uh, Der Lanzer, yeah. uh, which both appear on Death Hammer. Uh, you yeah. also um, released the title track of Death Hammer as well. Yeah. Uh, have you guys heard any feedback from the fans about those songs? The special part about the EP is, is that it's the German version of Lanzer. So um, I've seen, I've singing in German for the first time in my life. Oh. Because when I had the idea of the songs, uh, the lads already were asking me, like, Martin, how about trying, you know, to, to write a German lyric, which was very really hard, because I've, I've got this, um, yeah, I've got it, like, in English in my head, you know, and then you have to switch over into German. It's, I mean, I speak the language very well, but it's different if you write a lyric and then have to rhyme on certain, certain things. So, uh, but, right. you know, with, with help from someone from Central Media, Stephanie did a great job, and he translated it more or less for me, like, with rhymes. And it turned out very well, but it's a special one, you know. So um, it's not just that we released an EP for just the EP, but there's something special on it that it's worth to buy for fans. But the damn thing was sold out in one day, you know. As, as soon as wow. it was uh, as it was online, it was gone. So I mean, that that shows us that you know that's, that there's a lot of fans just chasing and chasing it. And luckily, we still have a few copies left for friends and you know some really die-hard people that we know and. Uh, we were able to, you know, give that as a present. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, the reactions are overwhelming at the moment. I mean, just for the songs, and uh, yeah, our fans really seem to like it. So, you know, we're very pleased to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Because I mean, if it's sold out and within the first day or even the second day, that pretty much just attests to the type of music that you guys have. That how good uh, <laughs> your your songwriting abilities are. Yeah. Um, yeah, probably. I mean, it was it was for us. It was a surprise as well. But it just they, they you know, social media put the thing online and it was just gone. Funny story behind it is that there's a couple of special ones in red and blue vinyl. And unfortunately, someone made a mistake at the you know at Century Media's and uh, 
forgot to uh, save us a few copies of those, and they're, they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we only have, so we only have the black ones for ourselves, and not like the special collection ones, you know, which oh, are now apparently someone gave me like a link for eBay, and someone is trying to sell it already for like a hundred euros, which is completely ridiculous. Oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I'm sure some days you wake up and you're just wondering, huh? Do I want to play the red one or the blue one? Oh, crap, <laughs> I've only got the black one. What's going on? Yeah. If you had to choose, what songs would you say uh, would you say are your favorites from Death Hammer? But well, I like them all, really. I mean, I could play them all live with, with a lot of with a lot of pleasure, pleasure, you know, really, all of them. But um, if I had to make some, yeah, say there's um, a gun in your head and you need to. Well, I like the title track very much because it's very strong and catchy. And, and strange thing is, I think I, I don't think I've ever sang on a song that's so catchy than this one. I mean, it's even more catchy than than, than Death of Brutal Way was, which already had like a catchy chorus. So we were looking at each other when we played it, so like, hmm, is this it? You know, like, because we expected more or less like a song with a title track, with the title of Death Hammer, it probably will be turn out to be like a 10 minute kind of epic, you know? And then we ended up like not even three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, no, but uh, yeah, so I think the title track, and I really like, uh, I really like Lancer too, and um, the last track as well, as the Magna Man of Rises, is kind of, yeah, it's yeah. a bit untypical asterisk, but um, yeah, it's got a, it's got this killer riff that keeps on dragging on. I, I asked Paul to do that because I wanted to use the it as a vocal part, and then I still like love Rain of the Brood and the Floor. Well, anyway, go again, you know. I mean, I like them all really, but yeah, maybe those three are really outstanding. What's funny is that you actually picked my 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 three favorite tracks. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that uh, it's, it's 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 sometimes it's very odd. Just it's just to see. It's like. You got you obviously feel that same way, and it's it absolutely shows on the tracks because I, I I don't know if, if I'm spoiling anything here, but the last track as you said as the magma mammoth rises, the song title basically spells out exactly what it is. It's almost just an eight minute uh, an eight minute crushing death metal and doom metal song. It's it's probably one of the best ending tracks I've heard in, wow. in a very long time. Well, thanks a lot for that one. Well, there was a, a a countryman of yours. I did a radio. Uh, it was a radio, and, and he had this like, "How many weed did you guys smoke to come up with a title like that?" <laughs> and I was like, "Well, you know, we and we are a non-smoking, you know, non-weed smoking band, so that's probably why it sounds also heavy because we're not laying in the corner like, uh, you know, stone." <laughs> yeah, you're just not trying to be out there, man. Huh? Yeah, you're just not trying to be out there. It's just something that regularly comes to you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> you guys have always had very, uh, very interesting song titles, and uh, as I mean, into the time wastes of yep. days when blades turn blunt, <laughs> <laughs> we doom you to death. <laughs> it, yeah, it, that was just the fun of it, you know. Yeah. It, well, the it, thing it, is, it I always, I always try to be a little bit original, you know, in the kind of song titles, and not just original, but also that you know what it deals with, you know. I mean. It doesn't have to be something like 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 into the time waste. It's, it's of course like non-existing. It's like science fiction more or less. Right. You know, that's 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 what the song says too. It's some it's about some bunch of robot mercenaries that travel throughout the galaxy and, and you know like uh, constantly at war with all kinds of creatures and then they dive into these things like the time waste where where time meets death and that's the end of all the universe if they don't fix that problem. That's a bit of the idea behind. It. I don't know. You know. If, I read too many comics sometimes, I guess. But that's, that's a bit of the idea behind it. But why not, you know? Yeah, I mean, if that's not a death metal idea, I don't know what is. <laughs> Asphyx are actually uh, slated to play a handful of shows and festivals, such as Extreme Fest, Obscene Extreme, Summer Breeze, and the Neurotic Death Fest. Yeah. Besides those, um, do you guys have any plans on doing any time of extensive touring in support of Death Hammer? No, not really. No. no we're more or less like a non-touring band, but... You know, the thing is with touring, I mean, it's all about that you show your face and that people are able to see you and, and you, you know, that you promote the album on stage. And it doesn't really matter if you do that 20 days in a row and play like, you know, three weeks of shows throughout Europe, or if you play 20 shows and then, you know, every weekend of the year and you are somewhere else. You know, it's basically the same. But there's two reasons why we cannot why we cannot tour. First is that you know Bob with his with his with his boys, you know his sons, mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, he just he, he just doesn't want to leave them, you know, like for several days or weeks or whatever behind. He just, you know, next to that, it's impossible because his wife's working as well. And then all the lads have, have jobs, and especially for Paul, who's like a teacher, uh, he can only have days off when, you know, the students, you know, when the kids have, have days off, when they have their holidays. So it's really hard to combine. It's, in fact, it's impossible. So that's why we do it this way. And, um, yeah, we play as much as, you know, as, as possible. I think last year we did about 15 shows with Asfix. And I think I did about 30 or something with Hill of Bullets, which is, you know, still like quite a lot. I mean, if you, it, it, for me, it was almost like every weekend I was gone. It would be easier personally for me if you go, okay, you know, just have a three week or four week tour. And then, you know, I don't have to do anything else for the rest of the year. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, but, uh, you know, the, and, but in this way, it, it's nice. I mean, you fly somewhere, you go in all kinds of different countries. I mean, this year with Asterix, we play in Greece, we play Romania for the first time. We play Portugal for the first time. We do the Czech Republic. We go to Finland. So, you know, we, we you know we show our faces everywhere, basically, and people can just come and watch out there. And that's what it's all about. The only problem, of course, for us is, is the U.S., because we showed our faces on the Maryland for two times. And, uh, yeah, the thing is, is that it's just really hard, not just because of the regulations that are there, to, you know, to come into the country as a band, but also it's, it seems that, at the moment, like death metal is um, really, really like a small kind of scene. It's very difficult for bands first to get offers for touring, and next to that, then, then you know, you hardly will have an audience. I think Grave broke off their tour just because there was lack of interest, really. That's that's actually that's really awful to hear because uh, I absolutely do understand what you're saying. Because, like I said, I do live here in the states, and that mm -hmm. is something I've experienced firsthand. And and not to mention, it's like every time that I see a tour come up that has a bunch of bands that I would really love to see. And I, all of a sudden I just see Europe only. They're not playing the U S and then, yeah. and then we just get a bunch of tours here in the U S where it's just nothing but big names who tend to just play the same song, the same melodies, same song structure, everything. And there's just not a whole lot of uh, variation when it comes to uh, extreme metal over here in yeah. the States. So my heart yeah, just sank Unfortunately, because it is, it has been completely different, like, in, you know, let's say like a decade or one and a half decades ago. But I don't know exactly what changed, but it's just really, you know, there is a market for it, but it's more or less like a, a bunch of really die-hard, dedicated death metal fans. And you see it in the labels, too. I mean, they, they're more into this metal core or new metal mm -hmm. or death core, whatever they want to call that shit. I mean, that, that seems to be pretty big at the moment. For us, like, as, as the style of metal that we play, it's, it's really hard. I mean, there's a... In L.A., there's a nice festival called G Gathering of the Bestial Legion every year, which uh, Juan of, um, of Iron Room tries to set up all the time. I like to play there on that one just to be, you know, on the West Coast for a while. And maybe, you know, you can pick a show in, in San Francisco, go quickly to Mexico or something and do something there. But for the rest of the country, it's just really, very, very, very hard. Maybe it's one in Chicago or something, but uh, there you have it. Yeah, believe me. I mean, us old school die diehard metal metal fans are still still here supporting you. We're, we may be a little harder to find, but we're we're still here. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, because we get many many reactions, and we, you know, it says that uh, uh, because Death the Blue Away at the time was not released by Century Media itself in the U.S. It was done by um, uh, Ibex Moon, you know, John, and it was yeah. the best selling. Uh, uh, independent kind of small label album of, of the whole last year. So, really? I mean, yeah, so we sold, you know, for that kind of, um, you know, for that kind of label, we sold really a lot. And, and with all the downloading that's going on nowadays, it's just really a good sign. But that's the thing with metalheads, you know, they don't download, they buy the albums that they like. <laughs> yeah, we always love to have the physical copies, look through the sleeves and just, it, has, yeah. it ha feels like it has a whole other atmosphere when you're actually holding the disc in your hand. Yeah, definitely. And not just clicking play on some application somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, speaking of the longevity of Asphyx and seeing how things have changed, um, over your career, you guys have always had a very consistent, uh, uh, mid-paced and crushing sound. Um, have any of you ever thought of like maybe wanting to go in a different direction? No, never. Not with this band. That's just not even a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> no. Because I know the lads, you know, I know what that, that, that all everything what we do that everybody likes to do. The thing is, if people could see us, how we write songs in the practice room, that you know, it's, it it goes like, okay, Paul has like a couple of riffs, and then we use the modern day techniques of you know, he puts his guitar into the PC and records the riff with some kind of a basic little drum tempo behind it, and then he sends it to us with a question, you like it or not? 
you know, so we can listen to that. And then all of a sudden we have, you know, there's more riffs coming until we think, hey, you know, we've got about 10 or 20 right now. Why not go and jam a little bit with that shit in, in, in practice room? So then we make an appointment all together and uh, we meet each other and then we start, yeah, you know, see what we can do with all these riffs, how many times you can play them, which one fits with the other one in a song. And if we got a song ready, then we completely freak out. You know, you can just see that we like the song then because we start banging, we start screaming, grab extra beers or buy new ones because the other ones are finished. <laughs> you know, and, and yeah, and then we go, yeah, this is the one. And then we tape it on some really old school fucking tape recorder, <laughs> which is, I think, uh, it's 30 or 40 years old. Jeez. Well, you know, yeah. And, uh, which, and then I put that one on PC so, you know, the lads can have it for themselves to listen it back again on how the song structure exactly goes and just to have the rehearsals for ourselves, really. But um, that's how it goes, and that's that's um, yeah, that's how you can see that we are really into what we are doing. And sometimes it's not even a thing of thinking, you know. If, if Paul comes up with a certain lifts, uh, we don't even have to ask Bob like, oh, what kind of tempo you have in mind. He just starts to drum, and that's it. Yeah. You know, like, okay, this is what I got in mind, and uh, we go, yep, that's it, Bob. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And he, 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 he hates the blast. I mean, it's not because he doesn't want to, but he really? just hates it. He goes, yeah, yeah, I don't like blast beats, he goes. And we, you know, we hardly do. You know, I mean, as last week's, we never do, but we don't really like it that much. There's many bands that start all of a sudden blasting, and we go, fucking hell, the wish sounds way heavier if they quit the blast. <laughs> you know? That's just his fixed way, I suppose. <laughs> Speaking of uh, Paul, like sending you tracks and you guys just uh, examining it and listening to it, um, like, as you also mentioned earlier, you and Paul play in uh, another band uh, War that's World War II themed uh, called yeah. Hail of Bullets. Yeah. Um, do you think that uh, both of your involvement in that project may cross over a little bit into its fixed territory? Uh, well, not really. Well, maybe the only thing maybe is, of course, like the sound of my voice. But I do on purpose well first of all because it sounds better with the bullets and heavier i, I try to keep it more low in hill of bullets with asterisks i can do some hysterical screams and even you know like funny things in between sometimes you know like the laugh is and on, 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 or or um yeah whatever you know just something that comes into my mind when i just do that shit in the studio with the bullets it doesn't work because the theme is very and the concept is very serious you know yeah. you just can't make, gotta make a joke out of it if there's a you know, whatever, like 300,000 old soldiers die in Stalingrad. You just can't have a laugh in that song, you know, <laughs> really. But um, so that, that's, that, that's, that's my kind of, and of course, the way I write my lyrics is completely different because you work from a concept out, which is very difficult first. Next to that, it's a really a challenge, but it's always really, really hard. And Paul knows exactly if he has a certain riff, um, he knows already which one fits more to the bullets or fits more to Asterix. He just knows that. So he says, okay, I've got this riff here, and then, you know, I just immediately, I, I know that too. And then he goes too, like, yeah, you know, this is a, no, it's not an asterisk riff, this is more hell of bullet, so I'll keep, you know, I'll put it on the side. It's, um, I don't know what it is, it, it, it just goes really natural. I mean, from the moment that we did the first Hail of Bullets album, um, we knew what kind of style it then was, and what kind of difference it was between asterisk and that. And uh, it came natural in a way of, okay, that's the difference, and, and we feel it, we know it. And that's, you know, how you work with it as well. But of course, there's always people who go and say, oh, you know, they sound the same or blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, okay, so be it, you know? Yeah. yeah they, <laughs> to me, it's not that they, that they sounded the same. I did notice that, uh, that Halo Bullets tends to use more, uh, a, a few more melodic leads yes. uh, in, in the music while it's fixed. They, well, they still have a little bit of melody in them, but not to the point where it's like, okay, you think this is what you're going to get all the time, when instead you're also going to get that extreme healthy dose of old yeah. school death and doom metal too. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, but that's with the bullets. You can, you can put way more things in it because the, the, the songs, I mean, you have this whole kind of atmosphere, you know, over that kind of concept that you have and certain leads or melod melodies, uh, that they fit really good in, in, into it. So you can do a little bit more than just that. And of course, Stefan and Paul both, uh, well, Paul is more like the rhythm guitar player, but he also likes really, you know, to do like some middle melody parts. And, and, and but Stefan is more the kind of aggressive solo guy, you know. And you know, he likes to do certain things in, too, you know, with the bullets with that. So, I mean, you've got there's all these little differences that you have. And of course, you've got Ed Warby, you know, who's a complete different. I mean, Bob always considers himself like I'm just a crap drummer. I don't care, <laughs> <laughs> you know. 
He says all I need to do is like keep the pace, and that's it. And he does that beautifully. He does that fucking amazing. I mean, he's like a like a clockwork. But Eddie, he's just you know he's something else. I mean, he's like a world class drummer, and uh, not just um, not just a drummer, but also um, as, as a musician. I mean, he's a perfectionist, and, and that, that's also like. Uh, a big difference in, in working together with the bands. I don't mean it in a negative way. I mean, the fun thing is with, with Eddie is that he's so, he's so, such a perfectionist that I, you know, I even, you know, learn from him in certain ways. And, um, yeah, after so many years, sometimes it's just, yeah, that's really a pleasure. You go, oh, you know, that's indeed, that's a kind of rhythm way I've never thought of using my voice, you know, and, and, and uh, yeah, that's just, yeah, it's a great thing. Uh, like speaking of uh, of Hail Bullets, every, everybody in there, um, what has been in like legendary bands that span throughout the entire heavy metal world, and uh, and lately there's been there's been a, a, a large resurgence of like old like classic bands that were broken up for some time, uh, reforming and doing like reunion tours and even new albums. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any thoughts on this trend? We well, might have think about that and then say something because in the end with Essex I did the same. Yeah. <clears throat> but for me, it's what it, what's really important is that the thing is that many people told told me that that after we came back with Death the Brutal Way, they said, well, at least you were one of the very few bands that that reformed again and came with a good album. So apparently, most bands who do the same don't come up with good albums. Right. Uh, I don't know if that's the case because. At the moment, I haven't got any uh, examples in my head about that. But the most important thing is, if bands do so, then please don't do it for bloody money, but do it for the fun of it, and just for you know to, to, to show your fans that you are that you're back there and that you want to give them a good time and you know let them you know revive all these you know the good times of the past and and, and you know provide them some fucking killer classics and not just go on stage and you know play all that crap from your latest album. You just can't do that, you know. Right. I mean, Autopsy is a is a great uh, is a great example of a band that did it, the, you know, just as we do. I mean, we've met them fortunately again. You know, it was like a really nice thing of seeing them again after so many years because we we have been, we've had contact from the very beginning. I mean, Asterix and Autopsy always were friends. I mean, I was that already with them when I played in Pestilence, but it was just a great to see them. And you know, we just want to play live together and have a good time. And when you see them on the stage, you see them laughing and you see them having a good time and they're enjoying themselves and. Uh, Luckily for them, because back in the days they didn't have any success at all. You know, right. <laughs> same with us. I mean, you were just really in the underground, and only those people knew your name. And now all of a sudden, you know, people book you at big festivals and you know come up with a little bit of money at least. And uh, you know, the fun is still like 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 the the most important thing. And that's what you see with Autopsy too. And the last album was good as well. So uh, yeah. I'm glad. I mean, that's that's an example of a band that's, that came back and it sounds really good. But there's apparently there's many like. Uh, well, for which you go, like, why the hell did they reform again? Like, I remember, like, I remember, I mean, this was a trash band, but I remember uh, when I played with uh, Bullets and Essex on uh, Yala Metalli in Finland, I think it was a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, there was this German band called Paradox, I don't know if you remember them. That's not ringing uh, a bell. Okay, well, it, it's about around the time when, when Pestilence came with the Malaya arm, so it must be about okay. 88 or something, and they weren't really bad. But they were bloody gobbing all the time, you know, I mean... They were like, oh, the crowd doesn't do anything, and this and this and that. I said, well, yeah, well, no one remembers you, man. <laughs> you know, and and if you stand there for 550 people because the rest gets drunk, then you're bored in the death, so you do something wrong. <laughs> you know, so do do yourself a favor, go back to the wife and kids, you know, start your job again, and quit reunion, you know, with with the reformation of your band. This is not going to work. Right. You know? <laughs> That's just an example. Just the way of the world, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> This this may be a little off topic, but uh, I've noticed that you're among one of the last vocalists in death metal who still like to utilize a microphone stand when you perform live. Is, really? Yeah. Is is there any particular reason why you prefer to have the stand there? Yeah, I just like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, but I'm... you can. No, but you can just. You know, I mean, I liked it also uh, from certain singers that I, you know, that I like from the past. It's not just. Not just death metal singers, you know. Right. I mean, uh, whatever. Name an example. I, you know, Paul Rogers was doing it when he was in Free. Well, that's very long time ago. But uh, yeah, and, and I mean, I, I don't think he was such a. Well, he was not the best kind of singer that I knew. But I like the way that David Coverdale did it with his microphone stand too. You know, I mean, not that I, he's an easy, 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 
uh, he's an example to me or something, but I just like the way he did it. And uh, uh, yeah, to me, it's just I just stand the damn thing there, and 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 sometimes I grab it, sometimes I do things with it. It's 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 never intentional. It's just like it goes on instinct. Sometimes in the middle of the could be that I'm middle during the stage, uh, middle during the show. I, I just put it away somewhere, and then I go with the microphone in my hand. You know, but I just like that stand. I just like the stand. And maybe it's also because I've used to be a bass player and a singer. I don't know. Right. You know, then I all of a sudden feel like, oh, there's this strange kind of empty hands or something. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But and on the other hand, sometimes it's very convenient. I, if I have songs where I have like really a shitload of lyrics, like Death and Blues Away or Death Hammer, which is just singing all the time. Um, yeah, then it's nice to just, um, yeah, more or less lean on that microphone on the stand, and because I need to bend over a little bit, you know, so you can press more from the belly. Right. <clears throat> and um, yeah, it just kind of helps a little bit with it, for some strange reason. That's definitely so, uh, a good reason. I mean, help. If, if anything, it makes you, it makes your guys' uh, live appearances just more energetic. Just to see you just kind of go nuts with the microphone stand. Uh huh. Well, thanks. Yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes I do really crazy things. I mean, it happened already that I, in in just in the in the heat of the moment where you are really all of a sudden you you got this this adrenaline rush, and then you know you just break the damn thing in two, or whatever. Right. You know, and then you've got all these angry stage people watching at you like you just broke my microphone stand, you bastard. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm very sorry. You know, afterwards, and then you just you know you give them some money to buy a new one or whatever. Right. <laughs> Uh, uh, but they, those things can happen, yeah. Yeah, um, you you mentioned that uh, you, that you also uh, played bass a lot because uh, I mean, hell, we we can remember your performances on Crush, the Cenotaph, and the Rack. Yeah. Uh, uh, have, do you still uh, pick up the bass guitar at all? Maybe help out in writing uh, writing some uh, some grooves for any of the music? No, no I, I haven't touched it for quite a while, really, because I'm so busy with writing all the lyrics, and uh, I would only do that. If, if everybody would have a complete kind of uh, block in his head and nothing would come out, then I would say, okay, maybe I can, you know, provide a little bit of shit, you know. Uh, but I would only do it then. And then, but at the moment, you know, it's just, it's just for me, it's like really nice to just only focus on the lyrics and uh, and the vocals, and, you know, mainly for for, the, for both the bands. Right. I feel very, you know, it's very comfortable to do that. Yeah, and plus so, no, no, no. yeah, plus nobody can say that you're not doing a good job on just the vocals because you are tearing it up in whatever the hell you record. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's just it's not just you know people forget a little bit that I have to keep up you know to, with all kinds of things you know just to uh, you know to, to to be able to provide all the topics like like right now you know working on another concert for Halo Bullets I have to read another you know again like a whole pile of books and. Not just in in my own language, but in English and in German. Apart from 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 the pleasure in reading, uh, and and the learning also out of it, it's it's, all, it's also sometimes very difficult because you you know you work with all kinds of different languages. It's, it's you know when it comes to concentrating, it's pretty hard. And uh, well, if I if I was able, you know, if I was still doing bass and, and all that stuff, I, yeah, I don't know where I get you know where I had to get the time to yeah to read so much as I do. Yeah, you d you definitely have to process all that information because we all know how much how much there really is to still learn about the events of World War II, especially on the European side. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, you actually just said something that now uh now m maybe you can give me a little bit of information on this, but you said that you're beginning to uh to to research uh stuff for a new Halo Bullets album. Do you guys have any plans soon to maybe uh, start recording? Uh well. No, not really recording, but writing songs. I mean, we start we start writing this year, definitely. Wow. Awesome, that's yeah. that's that's yeah. excellent to hear. Yeah, we want to. Uh, I mean, after now, uh, you know, everybody will you know can imagine that because now you, we got Death Hammer, just, you know, it's coming out, and it would be ridiculous right now to, in the middle of that hectic, uh, to all of a sudden start working on on, on Halo Bullets uh, songs. You know, you need um, Very true. yeah, you need you need you know you need a little bit of peace on that side, and as soon as this is. You know, if, if, as our Essex is more in calmer waters, uh, yeah, we can start on that. But I already got the concept in my head, so uh, that's already done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I've got, I've got, I've got all the information as well. All I need to do now is, you know, like, like pick out the events from which I think that are, you know, important or useful, you know, to write songs on, and then just see what the lads can do with it. 
possible. Yeah, as I mean, with, especially since there's a, a less than two weeks left until uh, Death Hammer uh, yeah. is released to, for public consumption. We saw the 2011 and uh, just over a month ago, and uh, mm-hmm. and I'm curious as to what you been listening to throughout uh, the last year. Like, what what do you think might have been some of your favorite l- releases? Whether they be metal or pop, I really don't care. I, I want to know what Martin Van Drunnen listens to. Jesus, it's really hard because, you know, I'm, I'm never keep up with releases that come out in a year. You know, I don't do that like, okay, now it's 2011 what came out. I always discover something uh, <coughs> and, and, and then I start to like it. I mean, for, the, for now, all of a sudden I really start liking the Cramps. Mm-hmm. Don't even know that band. It's, it's kind of a horror kind of... Um, yeah, rocker psychobilly thing. Oh, okay. And uh, they're, they're pretty. I mean, they're pretty good. Uh, I mean, the singer already died like a long time ago. But that's that's the thing with me, you know. Then I discover them when when you know when you can never watch them live. Uh, right. But the lyrics are really sick, and uh, yeah, the music in a kind of way too. <laughs> so it's, it's yeah, and it's it's a kind of a different kind of influence that all of a sudden you pick up, you know, through, uh, along the path of, of things. But yeah, I mean, there's other kind of releases i mean there's a german band called blizzard that i really like a lot yeah i've got an advanced uh that yamna sent to me and there's there's good dutch bands now i mean we invite them many times and we do have dutch shows and where we can um yeah when we are able to you know to pick out the support that we like or that we want to play and there's a good kind of um um yeah rise all of a sudden of old school death metal bands in, in, in the Netherlands and I like bands like like they're really young kids but they're doing it with uh, yeah with full enthusiasm and it's really nice to see that uh, uh, yeah that the, 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 you know that the style that we play is is, is been taken over by um, by the youngsters it's really cool so there's bands like Body Farm or Nailgun Massacre or Entrapment or uh, Funeral War and you know I, I I really like them all in a way so that's that stuff also that, uh, that I listen to and that I like I'm also sure yeah. they're going to be happy as hell to hear you speak their names in this interview. <laughs> yeah, probably. I mean, they will. But, I mean, I've, I've met the lads. And, 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 and uh, well, the funeral has also got a girl. But, um, yeah, I mean, that they. Have, in fact, it was funny. This is a nice story. We completely forgot. Uh, I returned from a kind of a Christmas holiday. And uh, then uh, Bob and Eric, um, uh, you know, Eric who plays on the rack, but we're still all friends. And, we, you know, we do, we do things here and there again. And um, they said, well, hey, how about uh, going to Hochevin? It's a city uh, a little bit up north, more for me, uh, where, uh, you know, Entrapment and Nilgun Massacre and Funeral War are playing. I said, yeah, why not, you know, just, just go there and have a beer. And then there was uh, Hank from uh, Got the Throne standing there outside, and he goes, when me, Bob, and Eric walked out of the car, he goes, do I fucking believe my eyes? And I, we go, what? He goes, here's a fucking rack line up walking in. Yeah. <laughs> They go, oh, yeah, now that you mention it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so Alwyn was there, and Henry from God the Front was there, too. And then those bands were like, what the fuck are they doing here? And we were like, yeah, we're just going to watch you guys, you know. So they were really honored and pleased and uh, really happy. So we got a little bit drunk, and then afterwards, like, you know, we drove back home. Well, Bob wasn't drinking that much because he had to drive, of course. But, yeah, I mean, that's the way, if we've got time, that we do that. You know, and it's... it's um, yeah, that's something that we like, and I think it's something also that shows that we still have uh, have interest in what's going on. Absolutely, you know, not just go okay, local you know, scene. just hmm? yeah, for the local scene, definitely, because yeah. you know, like like these bands are also more from well, apart from funeral, but these bands are more like also from the region where we come from, and um, yeah, we always support that in a way. Oh man, unfortunately, uh, that's all I've got for you. <laughs> mm. It's just very interesting to be able to talk to. To such an influential person throughout throughout the throughout the years. I mean, hell, oh, wow. you've been at it for well over twenty years, it seems. Well, actually, the thing is, the fun thing with with Death Hammer too is that, uh, uh, if I may add this, is that yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, not only have we returned to Axel's cover work, uh, who did it like on the rack and last one and Crush the Cenotaph, and also like Love Their Life that in the DVD, but we also got back to Harry for some recordings. And um, I realized that I started everything in 87. So for me, it's 25 years. It's the name Asterix that's 25 years. And then when you uh, you know, have 25 years with this shit, uh, you release an album like Death Hammer. So, you know, that makes it even more uh, yeah, pleasing. 
yeah. with, and together with all these people that are, were involved from the very start. So that makes it all very special. It, you know, the thing has got a really, it, it's kind of, it's a very special album for us. Not just, be, you know, not just because we think it's very good, but it has all these small little coincidences that, uh, yeah, that are there. But it's very nice, really. If you, you know, just to think of it like, oh, this is all very, very coincidental, you know. <laughs> Yeah, because like I said, Death Hammer it just has that great classic at six feel. Plus, uh, it, it has it has the uh, it's got a lot of modern production to it, which just makes it sound absolutely just crushing. Just make sure you don't play it too loud, or else it's gonna blow out some speakers. It does. <laughs> it does. It was the, it was the first time in my life when I had to take a break from listening to Mac Mix because um, yeah, I felt like there was an um, was a knife from one ear to the other. Yeah, that, so I told the lads, like, okay, I'm going to take a break now for a day because, you know, it just, it just hurts right now. <laughs> and I hardly, I hardly say that. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, that, that should just attest to how, to just how crushing Death Hammer really is. I think a lot yeah. of people are really going to enjoy it. Yeah, I, mean, I hope so. And uh, yeah, I hope, you know, we can enjoy, enjoy that too, like live. We will. And also with the people that show up and attend to the to the to the stage uh, to the to the shows. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that really. I very much want to thank you again for taking time to speak no with problem. us here. No problem. Thank you very much. It was very interesting and it was a pleasure.